I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our first speaker, Mr. R.L. Dalrymple uh, from Oklahoma. He uh, spent several years working for the Noble Foundation, and uh, many of the crabgrass varieties that, that we recommend at the University of Tennessee and that maybe some of you are familiar with, uh, he had a hand in, in developing some of those, and he uh, now continues some of that breeding program. Uh, I know, and, and continues marketing some of those seeds, and I'll let him tell more about what he does and, and some of the, maybe the history of some of those varieties and uh, some of the things that he recommends. So we're excited to have uh, him with us tonight, and, and so with nothing further for me, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Mr. Mr. Dalrymple. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, Scott and Chris and Christine here in Oklahoma helping me put this thing together, and Appreciate the invitation. It's a chance to tell a little bit about what we got going. And uh, first of all, we're just going to go through about five pictures, photographs, just to show the crowd uh, the, the type of big crabgrasses we're working with. And uh, this first picture, well, the picture that was in my background, if you could see that before we got started to here, it was some cows grazing quick and big crabgrass in Arizona, believe it or not last year about the early part of June. Obviously it was irrigated, but it gives you an idea of what the, what the grass looks like. This picture we're looking at now is me standing in a, a growth of quick and big spreader crabgrass. We'll talk about that a little more later. Just to give you an idea that this is not grandma's yard grass, it's a, it's a big forage type. And actually it can be a foot, foot taller than what it is there. It's, it's nearly four feet high there. In this case, it was one of our seed increase box uh, of some time ago as we were developing these varieties. Uh, go to the next one, please. And uh, this is a picture from uh, one of our customers uh, back in North Carolina. This uh, big uh, crabgrass uh, 38 days after planting and it's 31 inches tall. And just to emphasize, we're talking about big kind of mean crabgrasses and good livestock crabgrasses. And it, it just gives you an, another idea of what, what they look like. Okay, next one, please. These are some Red Angus cattle uh, of a client of ours, a customer of ours. Uh, again, this is in North Carolina. Picture taken last year, June the 10th. And I didn't remember, don't remember the planting date, but around the 1st of May was when he planted it. And, and this is uh, this is quick and big spreader crabgrass like the one I was standing in there earlier. Next one, please. This is some of our calves last summer creep grazing on uh, quick and big spreader crabgrass. And when our cows are next to a crabgrass field, if we have the opportunity, we, we rig the fences and let the calves uh, creep feed. Crabgrass is an uh, excellent creep grazing grass. This happens to be quick and big spreader too. We work with uh, different varieties, but the pictures we're looking at mostly quick and big spreader for some reason. Uh, one more picture to go, I guess. And all of these crabgrasses are big, uh, productive type crabgrasses. They're, they're not your squatty yard kind of crabgrasses. They're very big, very aggressive, fast growing. Uh, this is just an example of how productive they can be. Uh, this was a hay cutting on uh, quick and big crabgrass, one of our fields last summer, uh, three big round bales per acre. And, and that's pretty good for Oklahoma conditions, 4,500 pounds of hay per acre. We didn't do uh, any hay samples, uh, forage samples on that. So I can't give any protein content information, but you get the idea. These are, these are very productive crabgrasses. I think that's the last of our picture and we're just going to have a, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, seminar conversation now and talk to, uh, to you a little bit about uh, crabgrass just as a plant. Uh, everybody knows crabgrass, but we don't think about where it came from. We don't have any reason to know where it came from maybe, but crabgrass originated in Africa and uh, somehow it went from Africa to Europe. And then somehow when the Europeans come over to us, they brought crabgrass seed with them, I'm, all, I'm sure, in uh, contaminated wheat seed and whatever they were bringing along. And uh, that's how it got here. Uh, there's five species of crabgrass in Oklahoma. 
there's 35 in the United States and there's 435 in the world. And that comes from Dr. Terrell that used to be with OSU here in Oklahoma. But the, an important thing too is every species, the picture's not showing full, uh, the every species has as much variation, I think, as, as it does as it does uh, between species. So our, our work was when we got interested in was to look at all of this and to try to pick out the, the best ones for forage production purposes. Uh, there's an enormous amount of variation in crabgrass. Uh, that variation is where the first variety came from and it was named Red River crabgrass because the, the mother plant was growing close to the Red River in Southern Oklahoma and that's a, that's a boundary to Texas. And uh, that, that's where we got our start. Some people kind of kid me around about being the father of crabgrass management. And maybe in modern times I am, but I learned the, the first things about using crabgrass as a real grass from my dad, who was, a, was an actual on purpose crabgrass farmer back in the 1940s and 50s when I was growing up. So when an opportunity came at Noble Foundation, actually in 1974, uh, to work with crabgrass as a real grass. I, I had a very positive director at that time and he said, go for it. So we started looking at crabgrass and we noticed right away there was extreme variation, some little ones, some big ones. And, and uh, make a long story short, we did some collections. We wound up with about 50 different individual plants that we looked at as uh, possibilities of, of making a forage variety. And it happened that the, the one uh, that we selected uh, best out of 50 plants was the one we called Red River crabgrass. It's a big type crabgrass, but it's also a runner type crabgrass. And uh, anyway, we released that. It, it was immediately successful. It was kind of humorous back in those times when we had our first crabgrass field day. You wondered if anybody was going to show up, but it was the biggest field day they'd had in 40 years. So it was instantly... Uh, instantly important. That, that particular strain produced over 12,000 pounds of dry weight grass per acre in the research plots. And there were some others close, but that one was the winner. And uh, we measured every time we cut. And uh, that, that year that we made the selection, we cut it five times and it produced seven feet of vertical crabgrass growth but that was seven feet in, in five different cuts. So gives you an idea of, uh, of how much growth these grasses can, can have. Uh, Red River crabgrass was not protected. My boss and I talked about that. And back in those times, they preferred to uh, release publicly. So anybody could, could uh, go ahead and produce it if they wanted to. And, and, and that's a good idea. But it wasn't very long when uh, it just got some messed up in the seed trade. It, it wasn't even Red River crabgrass anymore. And uh, for that reason, we'll get to it a little bit later. We kind of reselected it and uh, uh, re-released it under a different name. Next, we're going to talk about the one we call uh, Quick and Big. It's a very erect growing crabgrass. It, it doesn't have any runners. It doesn't have any decumbent stems and unless the wind blows the stem over or something like that it, it grows very much like wheat and oats does in the spring but it it stools out like crazy it, you can, it can have over a hundred tillers from from one plant coming from one tiny seed uh, in this case we I'm, I'm a private citizen but by the time this one's getting released and and it was we just felt it was necessary to protect it some so it is a trademark variety and that's going to help keep it clean and pure for a while. We hope for a long time. And, uh, but uh, it, it is a very erect growing, tall, very productive crabgrass. And I got the original little packet of seed that finally made this from a forage friend in New Zealand actually. And he didn't even remember where he got the seed. He got it from a, a seed source somewhere and he allowed me to have some of it. And we went ahead and worked with it. He, he retired and he wasn't interest, interested anymore in it anyway. Uh, Quick and Big Crabgrass was released in 2016 as a product of Dalrymple Farms here. And it was a combination or a compilation of nine very identical, very, very similar plants. And th that was all mixed together and seed increase. And that's what, 
that's what uh, brought on the first variety of these quick and big types. And then uh, the next thing was uh, repurification of the Red River crabgrass. I, I mentioned to you that it had gotten goobered up in the seed trade pretty bad. I had a lot of customers reporting to me that they'd had some bad experiences with it. Uh, it, it appears that just about anybody that could cut crabgrass seed and Red River crabgrass had a had a pretty popular name. They just called anything Red River crabgrass, but technical seed people here in Oklahoma encouraged me to, to re, uh, repurify it. And our, our Red River crabgrass fields were very pure. We'd been very nutty about that. So we went through the, the whole process, research plots and everything. We won't bore you with all that detail, but we did uh, re-release Red River crabgrass. In our case, it's called Dow's Big River. They told us we had to pick a different name. It is a trademark variety, so we're, we're hoping that'll keep it pure for, for a long time. And now back to the quick and big and quick and big spreader types, a little bit more on their growth. Uh, they can be nearly knee high when Red River crabgrass and Big River are only six inches high or, or ankle high. They have the genetic capability to do that. It's very impressive. Uh, I've measured in research plots, we can have quick and big and quick and big spreader producing almost a ton of dry weight per acre by the time uh, the Red River types are six inches tall, eight inches tall. So that's very impressive to a livestock. Man. They, they kind of like that. And these grasses, these two varieties can also produce uh, five to six tons per acre. And they do that pretty consistently. Now, everybody's mad about nitrogen costs these days and not in nitrogen supply in some cases, but you can't grow big tonnage of, of any kind of grass without feeding it. And uh, somehow we're going to have to bite the bullet and go ahead and uh, can uh, try to try to keep try to keep these and other grasses going. So we're going to uh, talk about the quick and big spreader a little bit. Uh, one of the things when we looked at quick and big after we had it out a few years and we keep looking at it, well, how can we make this better? How can we make this better? So we decided that if we could select the quick and big type that was a bit of a spreader, not, not a runner trap gas like Red River and Big River, but, but if it would spread out a little bit. And we had noticed there were individual plants in quick and big that had a little bit of a squatting tendency. The, the professor calls it decumbents, but not many people know what that word means. So we went through the research process. Uh, this is gonna sound crazy, but my grandson who's a full grown man and I, we, uh, we uh, broadcast a, a fan stand of our seed resource we had at that time and uh, searching through 90,000 plus plants, we found 35 that had a decumbent structure. That is, they, they spread at the base. Like I said, it's not a runner, but it is a, a stem that lays on the ground. Well, make a long story short, that was uh, culled down to nine correct, yes, nine similar plants. That nine went into making the composite that made Quick and Big Spreader. The Quick and Big Spreader and Quick and Big, you drive two by two fields of them, they look identically the same looking across them, but they're different down at the base. Where I thought was if we had uh, some, some protection at the base uh, that would escape the cow bite, escape the lawn, the, the hay mower bite, uh, getting too short, and getting stomped in the mud, we, we thought that would improve the, the quick and big a pinch. And I, and I think it's doing that just fine. So now we're gonna talk about planting any of these varieties and basically the procedures are, are very much the same. Uh, you just can't beat a good seed bed. And I know no-till and minimum till is getting more and more popular, but uh, uh, when you're planting a small seeded crop like this, it, it's sure good to have a good seed bed. In your climatic zone, three to six pounds per acre. Here in Oklahoma on, on dry land, we wouldn't dare plant six pounds per acre because we just we just don't get the, the summer rainfall that you guys get back there. Uh, you can cheat a little bit on the seed bed, but a disc, a field cultivator, seed bed, drug down, roll down to make a nice uh, nice seed bed is super good and works, works very well. One of the advantages of quick and big and quick and big spreader is that it's a slick seed. Uh, Red River crabgrass, most of the common crabgrasses, Dow's Big River crabgrass have a rough husk, got a little what I call peach fuzz on the seed. 
and that, that seed will bounce in a small seed box all day long and it just won't come out. But the seed of quick and big and quick and big spreader flows very well. Uh, and that's how we plant a lot of ours. And that, that's a big advantage to a lot of producers. It, it makes it easy to plant. Well, if, if you can't do the quick and big, you're gonna do uh, some other style of planting or you're gonna use one of these other varieties that don't flow. Uh, if the seed can be planted through a drill with a in a fertilizer mix or a cracked corn mix or a cracked milo mix and a lot of the producers in the southeast have pelleted lime that they can use and, and that works fine we don't even have that product out here but you can blend these any of these varieties in some kind of a bulk mix like that and and plant it through any any kind of a distributing uh, equipment from a fertilizer spreader or drill either one we usually use fertilizer, but we have used cracked corn, we have used cracked milo, and that works very well. If you're doing this and you're using a spinner spreader, you have to realize the seed only goes half as far as the fertilizer. If we're using a, a buggy, as we call it back here, a fertilizer buggy, uh, instead of taking a 40-foot swath, we take a 20-foot swath, and that laps the seed very well. We've had, we've had very good results with that. As far as planting days is concerned, uh, actually crabgrass gets planted even back into the winter and it just uh, lays there until warm, warm weather comes along and, and rain. Uh, but usually it's planted after the last spring frost. And then in this area, and I think it fits that area too, uh, up through the middle, of, middle to the end of June, uh, it'd have to be kind of an emergency planting to plant it uh, later than that, but it, it, it can be just for one growth. Fertilizer has to be talked about. And as far as uh, phosphorus and potassium, it's just like any good forage grass. It, uh, the same test results are, are applicable. And in our case, uh, on first growth, we're going to use uh, 50 to 75 pounds of actual nitrogen, either at planting time or at early stooling time after it comes up. And in a good summer, we're going to retop dress it. Now, you folks in what I'm going to call the southeast, uh, you've got opportunity to do three applications if it if it fits economics and things like that. Uh, research work shows that these crab grasses will produce uh, 35 to over 50 pounds of additional grass per pound of nitrogen applied, and that's a therapeutic dose, and and that, that's very good. Well, the cost is pretty high these days, but. Uh, a uh, fertilizer dealer here this, this afternoon and I were chatting and cost of fertilizer now. And if it's a stocker calf operation, you're going to get two to three more grazing days out of every pound of nitrogen. And as, as crazy as the econo economics is, that's still a very good increase in, in value. Now, cow calf fertilizer, of course, is, is going to be different. Uh, weed control needs to be talked about. And as far as broadleaf weeds are concerned, pig weeds and and croton or whatever you got, 2,4-D or the usual post-emerge uh, treatments, or the herbicides, it work fine. We've not had any problem with any of those, but I'll be honest with you, I'm a little out of date on some of the new stuff and the mixtures that are on the market now, but we're either gonna use 2,4-D or we're gonna use Weed Master, which is 2,4-D and Bandle, and we will use some gray zone P plus D sometimes if we've got some tough weeds that we're having a problem getting control. Talk a little bit about cropping mixtures with crabgrass and, and it, it's been used in a jillion different ways, but we're gonna to touch on some of them. There, there's a lot of summer mixtures with other, other grasses and summer legumes. The, uh, the, some of the other grasses, uh, the millets, the Sudan type grasses and, and that sort of thing. It's not a big advantage in my view most of the time, but, but that ain't. And any of the summer legumes uh, make a good summer mixture. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And some of the le summer legumes that, that I've had some experience with, especially when I was working with the crabgrass at Noble, were the Lespedeza. Eastern half of Oklahoma can grow Lespedeza where I'm at. It'd, it'd die about the next day after it sprouted, I think. And then uh, cow peas, particularly the vine type cow peas, I had some real good pastures at Noble Foundation that were in, in, in this case, Red River crabgrass and, and a hay type cowpea or some, some people call it the, 
just a vining type, grazing type cowpea. I don't remember brand, uh, varieties right now, but that can be looked at. We, uh, we had some success with mung beans as a forage crop in a crabgrass mix and uh, soybeans as well. There's some hay type soybeans, uh, which I consider grazing type soybeans. That, that's a, a good choice for a lumber as, as a legume crop for the summer. I've seen some uh, really super alfalfa and crabgrass mixtures. We don't have any of them. I don't grow alfalfa, but uh, working with clients when I was with Noble, alfalfa and crabgrass make a really nice mixture. The thing you got to remember is uh, you still need to do some surface renovation for volunteer management. And a chain harrow or in our country out of here, we got rotary holes. There's different things to, to scratch the surface to cause that mixture to keep repeating itself. And you know, you'd hope to get three to five years out of the alfalfa. So that, that's one that really uh, in, has always impressed me. Then the cool season legumes out here where I'm at, Harry, Harry Vetch is virtually the only one. But in your area, you've got white clover and red clover and and uh, other legumes that you could look into. And uh, I've seen some especially uh, good clover, red, white clover and uh, crabgrass mixtures in eastern Oklahoma. It's a 35, 40 inch rainfall area and it works real good. The best red clover and crabgrass mixture I, I was ever uh pleased to see was actually up in Illinois, Southern Illinois, a friend of mine up there had it and that made a tremendous mixture. So I think you guys in Tennessee and throughout the Southeast, you've got gobs of choices on making legume mixtures and where I'm at, we've got one and that's, well, maybe two, we can, we can grow alfalfa a little bit. And then, then of course, uh, the hairy vets that I already mentioned and uh, the renovation, you can, you could use a chain harrow, some people call a horse manure harrow, a spike tooth harrow. Out here we have an ancient old tool called a. It's it's really a it's a really a unpowered rototiller. It's a stubble mulch tool tool from the early uh, conserva conservation days, and we can we can just tickle the ground with the top of that rig, and and that makes it makes a good good enough renovation. So uh, any of any of these mixtures, in my view use top grazing techniques, kind of baby the legume a little bit. Uh, you gotta have legume, legume leaf to get good, quick regrowth, but uh, that can all be worked out in, uh, in the grazing program. Talk a little bit about double cropping, and that, this is really popular over here in the, the wheat belt country. And double cropping, cropping could be many things. We're talking about winter crop, crabgrass summer crop. Uh, the, my customers would call me from Arkansas to Florida. Most everybody is interested in annual ryegrass. A lot of different varieties to choose from. And uh, that, that works very well where the, the rainfall pattern is good. If there's a problem with it is that annual ryegrass laps over into the crabgrass season in about six weeks, plus or minus a little. So that, that has to be managed for and, and, and maybe suppressed a little bit. Out in our country, and either, either, either really from here to Florida, you can wheat and rye and triticale. I'm kind of nuts about beardless varieties. Uh, I'm kind of a lax grazer when we're grazing uh, these crops that are before crabgrass. We don't do it every year, but sometimes we do. So we, we use beardless varieties. We don't have any uh, mouth and lumpy jaw problems with them. And I'm, I'm remembering a, a case about three years ago uh, we we had a, a herd of over a hundred stalker cattle and a friend of mine down the road, and I were talking on the phone, and he had 25 calves in the in the medicine lot, uh, doctoring them for jaw infections caused from wheat beards, and we we're grazing beardless maturing wheat. Our uh, triticalian didn't have a didn't have a bit of problem. In double cropping, there are just gobs of different legume choices you can incorporate in with your winter crop double cropping and. That works very well. And we're going to talk now about grazing and and hay cutting management. Uh, before these big tall types are grazed initially, if, if at all possible, it ought to be uh, well, three fourths knee high, and then uh, graze it down through a paddock system, uh, three to six inches. Leave a lot of good leafy stubble, and uh, sometimes you can get a little more growth. But if you leave a good leafy stubble, it's, uh, it's very important. 
well, what's a leafy stubble? That's uh, three to six inches, and maybe even a little over six inches. And that's going to be used before the summer, but before the summer's over, but it's going to be uh, used in rotation. And we've kind of coined a, a term over the years. Uh, if you leave a good tall stubble, it grows back twice as fast and twice as much. And actually, it grows back more than twice as much sometimes. So that, that's a good thing to keep in mind. And at the end of summer, some way, mature cows, a mowing machine, hay machine, whatever, you wind up getting it all anyway. It's just picking a different time to get it. We've talked off and on about what I call renovation uh, and we need a little more because keep to keep crabgrass growing well, it, uh, it just needs to have a renovated or tilled soil. It doesn't need to be extremely deep, but there's something about that tillage that really encourages crabgrass. Some of the professors that I talked to over the years thought it was a flash of light that might help. Uh, some of it is uh, digging up a seed that's been buried a year and uh, it comes to the top where you can get oxygen and sprout. There, there's some reasons probably we, we don't even know. When I was still with Noble, I did a research project where we had like five different tillage treatments and one tillage treatment was no tillage. We started that research with 100% good crabgrass stands. In three years with no tillage, that treatment had no functional crabgrass at all. And one of the nitrogen treatments was 100 pounds of actual nitrogen. So it wasn't starved to death, but there, it just goes back that there's something about crabgrass that likes, likes that tillage. It kind of goes against the grain these days of people that are encouraging a minimum till or no till out here in the wheat country. Uh, we might grow some crabgrass, but it's not going to be very good. It, it just responds very greatly to shallow but thorough tillage. In my case, I'm gonna use a disc, the field garlic butter. Uh, several years ago, I in, in, in invested in a vertical tillage tool and that's a super tool, but you gotta have a serious need for it. Right? You can't stand the cost. We're gonna mark it one to three inches deep. We're gonna reform it with a drag tool behind or a culture packer or a homemade roller. And be quite frank with you, my, my homemade roller is the world's better than my uh, brilliant culture packer, but they both do a good job. Uh, tillage in the fall, when you're planting the fall crop, like wheat or ryegrass in your country maybe, that tillage in a double crop program actually helps the crabgrass next spring also, and you don't have to worry about doing the tillage in the spring. It, it's, it just fits together very well that way. Um, there's lots of good ways to do renovation and, and uh, tillage, if you want to call it that. These are just some of them. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, few summer, crabgrass is one of the few warm season grasses that nearly all livestock like. Cattle, horses, uh, crabgrass is one of the favored uh, grasses of horses in grazing or in hay. And uh, sheep and goats, uh, you know more about goats than I do, but goats just don't like a much, much of any kind of grass. We had a herd of goats one time on Bermuda grass at Noble Foundation. I thought they was going to starve to death before they ate anything, and we finally just gave up. And uh, we've had a couple of, uh, two or three really interesting cases over the years, people calling about crabgrass seed. And I've had two or three ladies call, and they had a jerk dog liked crabgrass. Now this is really going to sound goofy, but we, we provided the ladies with some crabgrass and they had a little, like one of them just had, a, had an old tub and that was her field of crabgrass for her dog. Same thing with cats. Now I've been around farm cats all my life and I've seen them eat grass a little bit, but uh, I've got some pictures of a really pretty cats eating chow down on, on crabgrass. And of course rabbits, rabbits out in the wild they live on crab on grass, and, and cra crabgrass is one of rabbits' favorite things as well. Talk a little bit about animal performance and, and hay trials and things like that. Crabgrass hay made well is one of the tastiest, uh, also most nutritious summer grasses we can grow for grazing or hay. And when I was with Noble, we did a hay feeding trial. We had a lot of Bermuda grass, exactly the same protein content as, as a batch of crabgrass hay we had. 
And this would have been Red River Crabgrass or maybe even before that, uh, one of the big types of common. And uh, we fed full cho free choice hay, crabgrass or Bermuda grass, and the crabgrass cattle gained 52% better on straight crabgrass than the Bermuda grass. And this wasn't tracy Bermuda grass. This was really good Bermuda grass. And then under grazing stocker cattle, we did a lot of animal performance stuff when, when I was with Noble. And over a period of 40 years of grazing crabgrass one way or another, we never had a negative or a weight gain loss on any kind of crabgrass. It could be dead from drought and we still got gains. And uh, that's not true with Bermuda grass and weeping love grass and some other grasses that I work with. Good to lush crabgrass produced 1.8 to 2.8 pounds average daily gain over many herds in many years. Pretty good record. When we switched to not only having good grass, but a specialized grazing program, we made it even better for the long term. And I'm talking about using first grazers and second grazers. We call them top grazers and stubble grazers sometimes. And those cattle that were on a first grazing program, 2.8 pounds average daily gain. Now, we were leaving eight inch stubble, sometimes even more than that. Then at the end of the stubble, we, summer, we could take it off as hay, or we could graze it with some dry cows or even with, with some wet cows. This gives you some idea of the quality of crabgrass as it's demonstrated by animal performance. And uh, mention to you, if, if uh, any of the participants uh, are interested, uh, our webpage is dalrymplefarm.com. We've got some educational material on there uh, and you're welcome to look at that. If, if you want to text me, I can send you a, a paper copy of educational material. We, we provide to anybody that's interested in crabgrass pasture or hay for that matter. That concludes my program, unless there's time for questions and comments. Uh, Thank you very much. That was, that was some really good information, uh, RL. That was, that was, that was really good. And, and you hit on a, a lot of stuff in a, in a pretty short period of time. So we, we appreciate that. We don't have any questions in the chat, but um, if anybody has any questions, you can, you can put those in the chat and we can try to get those answered. If, if not tonight, we'll try to get them answered and get you an answer uh, later on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over uh, for the sake of time. And, and again, Ariel, we appreciate you being with us. You're welcome to, to stick on with us for Dr. Dillard's presentation too. But um, I'm going to turn it over to Jason Evitz, who's the agent in Trousdale County. And he's going to introduce our next speaker because we know there's a lot of other warm season options that we have. Uh, besides crabgrass, we wanted to make sure to cover some of those. So, Jason, I'll, I'll talk yeah. to you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Dalrymple. Is our next speaker, uh, Ms. Leanne, uh, Dr. Leanne Diller. She's an assistant professor and extension specialist in uh, 4G agronomics with Auburn University. And uh, she may not realize, but I've been watching. I, I followed Alabama Forges on the Facebook page, and I've attended their uh, the alfalfa in the south and so I've seen several presentations from her and her colleagues and so uh, when we put this together I reached out to her so and I'll let you uh, Dr. Dillard tell you a little about yourself and then we can get started with your presentation. Thank you um, so I mean there's not really much to say I am the forage extension specialist here in Auburn I'm actually just today in a different place in Alabama was working with some other Tennessee agents and in-service training. So I, I feel like I've really got to be a part of Tennessee. And I guess a random fact about me is that I spent a whole semester teaching at Columbia State Community College down in Columbia. So um, not many people can say that they spent a semester teaching there, but I did spend my, my time in Southern Central Tennessee um, between my PhD and um, I'm moving on to my current position. But um, I'm going to basically, Mr. Darumpel is the expert in crabgrass, and I'm going to I have a few things on crabgrass, mainly as some stuff we've done with mixtures, but I'm going to focus on the other things that I think um, complement a system that would have a, a variety of summer annuals in it. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, let's see here. I'm putting presentation mode. All right. So um, obviously in Tennessee, the big thing is tall fescue. Um, Y'all have 
warm season perennials, but I would say the majority of producers, especially where y'all are, are gonna focus on a tall fescue system. Fescue is wonderful with some exceptions, right? So if we look at a tall fescue production system, we see that we really see a good flush of tall fescue in the spring. Right now, high time for fescue. Um, and then we see our summer slump. And then we do see some production in the fall. But on top of that, when we look at the fact that we, so if we look at, if I overlay this for the spring calving system, so this is our summer slump, we see that our, our spring calving kind of goes along with our nutritional needs of our cows, uh, depending on how you define spring calving that is, um, with the fescue production. Now, many of our Southern producers are fall calving. And when we look at our fall calving cow nutritional needs, they actually are the opposite of our tall fescue production system. And as you see, regardless of your calving system, we're not really meeting those needs during the summer. Now, on top of that, if you're um, doing stalkering, backgrounding, or, or trying to finish some cattle, tall fescue is just not really going to provide you anything in the summer to um, produce your cattle on. So in order to prevent feeding supplement, we're going to have to incorporate something. And summer annuals really play a part in that. So why do we need summer forages? Tall fescue is dormant during the hardest parts of the summer. It is a cool season grass. It is not going to grow. It may be there and it may be green, but it's not growing during the summer. On top of that, if we do overgraze it, and many of our producers do leave their cows on fescue all summer, honestly, this is going to reduce the stand of fescue over time. Fescue is a really persistent grass, um, relatively low inputs. It's, as I said, the bread and butter of our systems in the, in the upper south deep south, but if we abuse it, it will eventually go away. On top of that, most of us are still using toxic tall fescue. So for those of you, I'm not going to go into fescue toxicosis. Um, I was at a talk in uh, Spring Hill a couple of weeks ago um, where we talked about fescue toxicosis, but um, fescue toxicosis does cause issues with heat tolerance. On top of that, fescue the toxic fescue is the most toxic during the summer when the plant is stressed. So trying to get those cattle off of the fescue during the summer not only will benefit the plant itself, but as well as the cattle and increase our performance. And when we come down to it in most forage systems, our cattle are our, um, our output, right? The forage itself is not. So we wanna protect that cattle gain. So a lot of times in order to meet our nutritional needs during the summer, we end up needing to feed hay um, or feed, especially if it gets droughty, um, just especially if you're fall calving to help maintain body condition before calving. You know, it always surprises me that in, um, I'm from Northwest Georgia, just south of Cal uh, Chattanooga in a little town called Calhoun. And sometimes I see the worst condition of the cattle in August, not in January, as you would think, and it has to do with droughty conditions and the fact those animals are really stressed on that Kentucky 31 tall fescue. So summer annuals are really issue, uh, really useful in renovate our winter feeding areas. You know, a lot of times, um, especially when areas that the soil doesn't continually freeze, which is the, the South, you know, what we deal with is muck. Um, I lived in Pennsylvania for a while and it, the soil froze there and it was an issue, but in the South, that's not the case. So we end up with pastures that look like this um, through the winter. And I always tell my producers to try to confine their cattle when they are feeding to prevent uh, ruining the rest of their pastures. But this is a good place. I always tell them to pick the worst pasture they want to renovate because then we can put something in there behind it and we can kind of use the cows to till it. Um, so we can come back over after we pull the cows off of that and no till in some forages. Um, there was actually uh, Matt Webb who was, and I forget the county he was in, in uh, Tennessee. He's originally from Alabama and we just stole him back and he moved to, to Jackson County, but he was an agent in Tennessee and did a lot of work um, with Gary Bates looking at crabgrass renovation in hay feeding areas and how useful it can be. Um, we can also use it as a stored forage. So using summer annuals they're super high quality higher quality than even tall fescue um, in terms of our uh, 
their sugars and things like that, but especially higher quality than our warm season perennials if you're used in Bermuda grass, for example. So they are useful as stored forage. Many of them, including crabgrass and others, are not really easy to make hay out of because they're really difficult to dry. So making things hay, but also considering baleage. But also, as I mentioned, finishing cattle, we don't have a system in the Southeast that is good for grass finishing cattle, except for summer annuals, um, during the summertime that is. Um, unless you're gonna feed stored forages and grain, we have to rely on these, these systems for finishing cattle. And then for those of you who are interested in getting rid of your toxic fescue, um, we do have this system, North Carolina State, for the most part, has done a lot of work with the spray smother spray system in order to uh, smother out the toxic fescue and plant in novel endophyte tall fescue. So when we look at forage distribution in the southeast, we see that our perennials are kind of the crux of our system. They're going to grow during the um, Mostly in this system, cool season perennials, we're going to get them in our spring and fall, as I mentioned with fescue. And if you can see my cursor here, I'll turn on my pointer. Well, I can't see. There we go. My laser pointer here. You can see here we have our warm season perennials. We have our cool season perennials as well as our cool season annuals. We don't use a lot of cool season annuals um, in the uh, lower transition zone because we do have tall fescue. But when we're looking at this, where these fit in, we have our sorghums and our crabgrass that are gonna fit right in that, that summer slump where we see that for those of you, especially that don't have warm season perennials, well in that fescue system. So what are the pros and cons of using annuals? They're extremely quick growing. Typically I can get cattle out on um, summer annuals in as little as 45 days. They're grazable the first year. They're high yielding, high quality, drought tolerant, and can be grazed or harvested for silage or baleage, or in some cases, both. What are the cons? You have to plant them annually, just like a cool season annual. That can be time consuming and that can be um, costly. Now there are some exceptions, crabgrass being one of them. Mr. Darrymple mentioned that a little bit about the reseeding potential, but um, with our sorghums and millets, we do have to plant annually. Timing of precipitation. So trying to get that soil temperature up into the mid 60s and so that we can get germination of that summer annual seed, but not so late that we're into our dry period or summer can be a challenge. The further south you live, the easier that is. The further north you live, um, the harder that can be as your soil temperatures are, you know, take a little bit longer to warm up. Obviously there's additional costs for seed fuel and fertilizer. Those right now are particularly important as sourcing seed as well as fuel and fertilizer costs can be expensive. They're very quick maturing depending on the variety and the species, it can be difficult to manage. And because of this, they are management intensive. I've worked with several summer uh, annual varieties that we were grazing and we just definitely uh, struggled even as scientists to make sure that we were keeping them at a boot stage. They may, they um, matured very quickly. And even there's no golden forage, as I say, there are some toxicities that we'll talk about. So what are some forage options? We have crabgrass. You just heard from the expert, so I'm not gonna focus on this one. Um, it is an excellent option. Honestly, at this point, um, I hope Mr. Darumpel is still listening. It is one of my favorite summer annuals. Um, it has lower inputs, is easier to maintain the quality, and is extremely high yielding. But it, the, it really, to me, comes down to management. It's easier to manage than some of our sorghums and our pearl millets. Um, we have sorghum, Sudan grass, sorghum, Sudan grass hybrids. So these are all in the sorghum family. And um, typically you think about sorghum, Sudan grass hybrids are usually what we prefer. Um, sorghums are gonna be, you can kind of think of them similar to corn. They're very thick stemmed. They grow really fast. Sudan grass is more leafy and less stemmy, where sorghum, Sudan grass is kind of the best of both worlds. Then we have our pearl millet. <coughs> Other millets do exist, brown top millet, Japanese millet, but their forage yield is relatively low. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do suggest when using summer annuals or any forage, you do invest in forage varieties. Those other varieties can be a low cost alternative. 
<coughs> but you do struggle in terms of forage yield, and oftentimes they don't pan out. We have legumes. Mr. Darumpel mentioned some of those. The big ones for us are going to be cow pea, lab lab, sun hemp, and buckwheat. And then again, you have to replant the annuals every year, but they're generally higher quality than our per perennials. Oh, and I would mention that you need, in this case, especially in the fescue system, you're gonna to have to dedicate a separate area of the farm, but we'll get to that at the very end about how you can manage that. So um, I'm gonna go through this relatively fast. I don't wanna keep y'all here all night. I'll be more than glad to provide Jason with my slides so y'all can have this information. I just kind of wanted, if nothing else in my talk, to introduce you to these varieties and give you some information or these species and information on them. So if I go really fast, I apologize, but I will make sure that y'all have access to all this. And I did say, I did hear he said he was going to record it so that you can have, you can see that as well. So sorghum uh, pseudangrass and sorghum pseudangrass have historically <coughs> probably been the favorited of the summer annuals because they're super high yielding and fast growing. They do have thick stems that make them difficult to dry for hay. So traditionally they've been used for silage. Sorghum silage is, is you know, up there with, and I'm sorry guys, I'm dealing, been dealing with allergies. It's that time of year. Even the forage specialist is allergic to plants. <coughs> so they're a great alternative to, to corn for silage and baleage. They do have nitrate and prussic acid toxicity. I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes about what those are but those are things that you should be aware of, but not necessarily concerned. Dr. Ball told, has a quote that says, there are more cattle that suffered from the fear of bloat than bloat itself. And I feel like that's also the case with nitrate and prussic acid toxicity. However, you should be aware they exist. <coughs> so there are BMR varieties and we'll talk about that technology in just a second, but those do offer some advantage. The reason that maybe they're not as popular now as they have been is sugarcane aphid. This is a pest that's become extremely problematic, especially in the last five or six years as it has moved host from sugarcane into the sorghums. I will say there are becoming some sugarcane aphid tolerant, not resistant. Resistant would mean it did not affect them, but tolerant meaning it not affects, doesn't affect them as bad. Varieties of sorghum and sorghum sudangrass available, um, but those are still relatively new to the market. So um, that technology is still developing. When we look at some information, I took this data from a variety of sources. So that would be yield per harvest, not across the season, but you're looking at about 2,300 pounds per acre harvested three, uh, about three times um, per year. About 17% crude protein with a TDN of 50. They're well adapted to the Southeast. Um, they work best on well-drained soils. They are drought tolerant, but they also don't do well on acidic soils. So you wanna make sure you put some effort into your pH. Um, they're relatively large seed, so similar planting depth and planting rate, uh, planting depth to that of our cool season annual small grains, if you're used to those. Um, and But relatively small seeding rate. So if you're drilling them, it's going to be um, anywhere from eight to 20 pounds per acre of seed pure live seed, and then broadcasting um, is gonna be a little bit higher. The planting window would be April to June, but as I mentioned, we wanna do that when soil temperatures at the two inch range reach 65 degrees Fahrenheit. You can get that information from um, your local weather service. They actually will report two inch soil temperatures. But if you're into row crops, you'll be familiar with that. Um, right now, I would say in um, South Alabama, now down near the Florida line, yesterday they reached uh, at the four inch uh, soil temperature, 62 degrees. Mr. Darumpel mentioned it had been 91 degrees in Oklahoma. It was warm today um, in central Alabama. So we're definitely getting to that window as we go north that you could plant them. But probably in um, Tennessee, central Tennessee, we're talking, you know, probably mid-May would be your best window, early to mid-May. So pearl millet is more productive in drought conditions than the sorghum and Sudan grasses. Um, it's kind of like, I call it the wheat of the summer annuals. It's not, you know, a star, a diamond in the rough, 
but it's consistent and reliable. So it also tolerates a lower soil pH. So if, if you're in the super acidic soils and are still working on that, this might be a better option. It doesn't have prussic acid um, as the sorghums do. So that's not a concern. It does still have issues with nitrate toxicity. Most every annual, but almost every forage, honestly, has um, issues with nitrate toxicity. So you just have to manage your fertilizer. And it is resistant to sugarcane aphid. There has been some concern that eventually sugarcane aphid will go into the millets because it did go from sugarcane to sorghums. I think that that probably, if it does happen, it's gonna take a lot longer because there's less um, overlap in the genetics of those two species compared to sugarcane and sorghum, but it is a possibility. Um, it's easier to manage under grazing. You can see here, um, these cattle are grazing pearl millet. It definitely is a more tolerable forage, but it will bolt. Um, it does also have thinner stems, so it's not as difficult to dry for hay, but I would say you would still want to use a mower conditioner. Just about everything um, I talk about, I suggest a mower conditioner, even if you're doing baleage, to help reduce that drying time. So as I mentioned, it has nitrate toxicity. It's less palatable than the sorghums because its sugar content is lower, but um, as I always tell people, a hung just like, you know, I have two small children, um, and I always tell them, you know, what do they do if they don't eat their dinner? You don't let them, you know, you don't give them dessert. You just let them not eat because eventually they'll get hungry enough to eat. And a lot of people don't like to hear that about their cows, especially our station directors. But I always tell them, if you force them to eat it, they eventually will. And you just have to kind of wait those few days um, that they're going to eat it. So here again is some information. Again, similar yields, two to six tons. Um, this is Tiff Leaf 3, which is probably, at least in Alabama, our most popularly used pearl millet. A um, little bit lower quality, um, but similar TDN to the sorghums and sorghum Sudan grasses. <clears throat> so um, it does do better in sandy soils than, um, the, than it does clay soils, but it will work in clay soils as well. Um, I grew up in uh, a chirp pit, literally, um, and we do use it well there. The seeding rate is going to be similar to that of the sorghums. The planting depth is going to be a little bit lower. It is a smaller seed. Um, here's listed some varieties, but I'll get into in a little bit later um, how to find information on specific varieties. So here's some information um, from actually Dr. Hovland. Um, who is one of the co-authors of Southern Forages. He did a whole career in Alabama before he went to Georgia. And this is some information on Tiff Leaf 3, which is the um, parent uh, line of Tiff, uh, excuse me, Tiff Leaf 1, which is the parent line of our current Tiff Leaf 3. So they saw 68 grazing days and they were getting about three animals per acre, but ranging from three to 11, depending, they were trying to keep that grazing pressure on there. Um, getting an average daily gain of about one and a half pounds per day. Now, you may think that's a little on the low side, but remember that remember that in the summer, we're fighting the heat. So even if we have a high quality forage, we're really going to struggle on our gains merely because the cattle are just not going to do as well because they're so hot. Looking at gain per acre, which is actually my preferred uh, way of looking at it because gain per acre takes into account not only individual animal performance, but also how many animals are on there or your stocking rate. They were able to get 400 pounds of gain off of that uh, pasture per acre over that 68 days. So in about two months, they put on 400 pounds. And then you can look at the current market value to think about how much money that would be. So um, that can show you there's there's you know, good um, ability. And really, we only need it for that 60 to 90 day window in the summer. So just real quickly, I mentioned the drying issues with some of these um, forages. You can see here a comparison of our different stems. So um, we have our sorghums here on the left, um, our sorghum Sudan grasses in the middle, and then you have our pearl millet. So you can just kind of get an idea of those differences and how large those stems can be and why we suggest a mower conditioner for these. So BMR, I mentioned that. And so if you're not familiar with that, it stands for brown midrib. You can see in this picture here, um, it literally means brown midrib. So what that is, is a gene that they discovered um, several years ago in uh, corn and other summer annuals, but also in sorghum that yes, it makes the brown midrib 
brown, but it also reduces lignin. So that lower concentration makes the forages more digestible and more palatable. There's been a lot of research in silage production that show that it really does increase dairy cattle performance when produced as uh, sorghum or as silage. Here we can say there's BMR varieties of corn, sorghum, Sudan grass, sorghum Sudan grass hybrid, which I put as SSG, and pearl mill are available. I will say in grazing situations, the results are very inconsistent. And as you can imagine, this is a GMO technology because they are adding in a, or deleting out a gene, changing the neat genome of the plant. So it's very expensive. So, so far I have, um, not been convinced that there is any benefit in a grazing system, but we definitely can say there is in a harvested system. When we look at this, you see that the quality is very similar in terms of TDN, um, our fiber components and yield, the difference being in the lignin and ADF or our indigestible fiber fraction. So this is um, a study out of Texas A&M where they looked at grazing of uh, non-BMR and BMR um, sorghum Sudan grass, and they saw um, the stocking rate was very similar. The average daily gain was slightly higher than the BMR, and they're resulting in um, the gain per acre being slightly higher, but it was not statistically different. So even though numerically it was greater, at this point, the variability meant that there wasn't any difference. Um, <clears throat> here is um, more information on that. They were able to get 50 days in Texas on BMR sorghum Sudan grass, stocking rate of, and I'm going, this should be 1.5, the way, head per acre. I just realized there wasn't a decimal in there. It definitely did not stock uh, at 115 animals per acre. So that was, should be 1.15. Sorry about that. So on this case, they were stocking at 2.6 animals per acre with an average daily gain of 2.8 with 359 gain, uh, pounds of gain per acre. So getting into some legumes, Dr. Darumpel, Darumpel mentioned this um, as some of our options. So probably the most commonly used, I think at least in Alabama is gonna be cow pea. Cow pea is actually black eyed pea. I always tell my students that um, it is um, the same thing as we eat on New Year's day. So it is very um, well adapted to the Southeast, relatively well adapted to acid soils, being that it is a legume. You can use it for hay, silage, or grazing it. It does fix nitrogen, which is amazing. The crude protein is very high, as with most legumes. I would say that the biggest issue is going to be that um, it is not super grazing tolerant. I typically use iron clay because that's the most commonly one you can find. And I definitely can see it in there in the first grazing of the year, but when I rotate back, typically the cows have selected for it and it is not there anymore. Sun hemp is a growing um, one in popularity. I actually um, asked Dr. Mason, y'all's um, relatively new. I, to me, she's still new because she was at Auburn and I can't believe she's been at Tennessee now for a year and a half. But um, I asked her earlier this week if sun hemp was illegal in Tennessee. She told me she did not believe it was. I know in Mississippi it is, but sun hemp is one of uh, my honestly favorite summer legumes because it's a wrecked growth habit. It's not viney like most of the others. Uh, because of that, it is need to be um, grazed a little bit differently. Auburn um, did a lot of work on this and has several varieties on the market. For the most part, when you buy sun hemp though, it's just gonna be generic sun hemp, but it does fix nitrogen. It has an erect growth habit um, and is pretty high yielding. So upwards of 10,000 pounds of dry matter per acre. The seed is a little bit larger than some of our other legumes. So you can plant up to an inch um, and it's really popular in cover crops. So the seed can be a little bit difficult to get, but um, you can find it. I will say that AU Golden and AU Darbin, um, AU Darbin is not on the market anymore. AU Golden is, but it's very difficult to find. So I have just been using generic sun hemp and have been pretty successful with it. This picture actually was taken um, in Marshall County, Alabama, which is up near, um, is up on Lookout Mountain and Sand Mountain up uh, on the Tennessee line. And this is a, a producer that is mob grazes, summer annual mixtures, and you can see how that sun hemp um, does well, especially with those sorghums in there. 
One thing that we've done some research on here in Alabama is forage soybeans. So we typically see, think of seed soybeans as a row crop. And you can see here, these are actually our forage trials. We planted them as row crops, um, but so they look like that, but they actually were um, forage trials. And, but they have actually been used as forages longer than they've been used for um, old crops. So Laredo is the most common variety that's been around, but it's over a hundred years old. There are some newer varieties on the market. We have seen that it's not very grazing tolerant. We have it in a trial in central Alabama with um, crabgrass and pearl millet. And it definitely was there at the beginning of the season, but my mid season, um, it was not there anymore. Also, we have had issues with sourcing specific varieties. So, um, we have struggled trying to get the same varieties every year for that soybean, but I really like it. I think it offers something kind of unique. Again, like the sun hemp is more erect growing and not viney. So one thing about uh, forage soybeans is soybeans tend to have an effect of row spacing. So we did a, on our research trial on the soybeans, um, I was told that the wider row spacing actually allowed the plants to grow shorter and wider, which would help with forage yield compared to smaller row spacing. So we looked at 14 and 28 inch row spacing. We didn't see a difference in terms of yield. I will say that when we looked at it, we inconsistently got a second harvest over the two years of the two locations. So we didn't report that data. We just focused on the first harvest. But we did see that there was a difference in regrowth um, on those two row spacings. But in general, we didn't see a difference. Now we did use the same seeding rate. So our plants at the 14 inch were further spaced apart than those at the 28 because our populations were the same. If we had changed our uh, row spacing or our planting rates accordingly, we probably would have seen some differences, especially in yield. In the same study, we also looked at grazing tolerance by clipping at different heights. And I know this, this graph is really busy, but I'll tell you the big thing is we really didn't see any differences. So um, when we looked at stubble height, we did see that there was a difference, a significant difference in yield, as you can imagine. Guess what, guys? The higher you cut it, the less you remove. I mean, we already knew that. So um, the lower you cut it, the, um, the more yield you were able to get. But that did negatively affect your, um, so IVDMD is our in vitro di matter digestibility. So while it didn't really affect our TDN too much, we're talking about 3% TDN, when we looked at our in vitro dry matter digestibility, we did see a significant increase because we were getting a lot more stem. Um, and legumes have a lot higher insoluble or um, indigestible fiber than grasses as a part of their overall fiber. We looked at a bunch of different varieties. The variety we saw, um, Laredo, like I said, that's been our tried and true over a hundred years. It did perform the least. These two varieties here are at eight level and nine level rating maturity, grain um, or soy, um, excuse me, seed oil varieties that we wanted to compare to. Stonewall definitely we saw did the best we saw a little bit of difference between our South Alabama and Central Alabama locations, but it wasn't significant over two years. There was a lot of, and it mostly had to do with precipitation. So in one year, we would see that one station had a lot higher yield, and the second year, it was the opposite. And we related that all back to not necessarily temperature, but the differences in rainfall between the two locations were to about four hours apart. So this is a summer annual variety trial that we did in central Alabama um, over two years. It was very informal. We had a couple of reps. We weren't really managing it. You know, we we're managing it like forest, which means we could basically abuse it. We weren't doing a hardcore variety trial. But when we looked at it, we saw that, um, you know, in general, our sorghum, Sudan grasses, and pearl millets yielded higher than our crab grasses. And while our legumes did really high here, again, if we were to graze this, um, there they would be grazed to the ground. They wouldn't really bounce back. We did not take into account uh, uh, quality at all. So a lot of this, as you can imagine, in here is going to be stem. And so definitely, because we were simply just harvesting off the cows will actually rip the leaves off and leave the stems. So that kind of artificially makes the sorghums and the millets a little bit higher in yield, especially the sorghums. So we did another study um, with sugarcane aphids because I had the great idea of thinking, hey, 
if we make if we put in a mixture of sorghum with other things, the sugarcane aphids aren't going to want to fight all the crabgrass and other things in the plot to get to the, the sorghum. So we did a trial in central Alabama looking at mixtures of crabgrass, or excuse me, cowpea, which is this treatment, cowpea and crabgrass, crabgrass, sorghum, sorghum and cowpea, sorghum and crabgrass, and then three-way mixture. So in this SI is the uh, is a sorghum that we actually implied a secticide to. So we saw that again, and these plots um, were, there's nothing you can really spray when you're putting legumes and especially annual legumes and grasses together because you can't use a pre-emerge because you, they're annuals. And you also, you know, you can't, the, either you need to be able to select for grasses or legumes. It drove our row crop skies crazy because my plots were ugly as far as they were concerned. Um, but you saw that there's, you know, definitely including the cowpea helped our, our crude protein as you would expect. Um, and then when we looked at our NDF and ADF, there weren't a ton of differences. Um, and then in a second, I'll, tell, I'll actually show you the sugarcane aphid data, which is actually to me the most interesting part of that study. So sugarcane aphid, um, in about 2012, we saw the shift of the host, I mentioned that from sugarcane into sorghum. This is a picture we took in that trial that I just showed you. And I'll tell you, they were disgusting. I don't do bugs and I came up with this study and I always tell my students that I'm never willing to do anything. i never will make them do something I'm not willing to do. And um, counting those aphids was pretty miserable. It was July um, and uh, they really hated me for that. But Sugar canes make a honeydew and reduce forage quality, and it can be quite problematic. So real quick, we didn't see a lot of differences. The big thing was once we harvested them, we saw the sugar cane aphid populations really drop off, and they didn't really come back. We also saw a huge different variability in year to year. So this was year one. We saw um, up to over about 450 aphids per leaf, where in year two, we only saw 10% we saw of that. So we did see the biggest issue was the, ver the variability in sugarcane aphids based on a lot that had to do with us uh, temperature, uh, excuse me, moisture. So back to our nitrate and prussic acid poisoning. So one thing you should concern about is with all of our summer annuals is the accumulation of nitrates. Plants take up nitrates um, in a luxury, even if they're not growing because of droughty conditions or excessive uh, cloud cover. So you just want to keep an eye on that. You can test for this. Um, you just don't, we believe to say don't graze if you're concerned about it for a week after um, a drought ending rain. Um, and I'll show a second in difference in the plant and how the nitrates go as well. Prussic acid is only occurs in sorghums and Sudan grasses. Um, once the, um, it's most of an issue after frost, but also after a drought, so we suggest waiting seven to 10 days after a drought, uh, a killing frost in order to graze or seven to 10 days after a drought ending rain. So in nitrate toxicity, we do see that it's the highest at the base of the plant and the lowest at the top. So if it is a concern, you can lightly graze um, while you're waiting for those nitrates to go down to help give you some ability to graze that material. Um, if you plan on incorporating a summer annual into your system, I would say you definitely wanna get your seed early because especially as we've seen recently, it's really hard to get the seed you want, especially if there's a specific variety. We do variety trials all over the Southeast. Um, every state for the most part has one. And I definitely suggest trying to get that information, especially if there's an experiment station relatively close to you um, to be able to do that. Um, and then the last thing I'll leave you with is, so I just told you like, we shouldn't plant summer annuals with fescue. So what should you do? Well, I suggest typically leaving 10% of your pasture for summer annuals. So taking 10% of that fescue land and converting it into annuals. But then what do you do with that? I've just told you, kill 10% of your acreage. But the cool thing is then you can go back and plant those with winter annuals. So um, if you do have a perennial system, both Bermuda grass and Bahia grass both respond well to overseeding. So you can actually even do that well. Um, you can also plant that 10% um, if it's in summer annuals, you can plant it in winter annuals. So this will allow you to then 
have an annual system that you can use for mob grazing or liniment grazing to supplement your fescue when your fescue is not growing well. Um, hopefully that gave you a pretty good, at least introduction into some summer annuals. Um, they're a really good, useful tool. As we always say, this is a tool to put in your toolbox. You shouldn't go out and right now and plant all of your acreage in summer annuals, but they definitely have a place. Here's my contact information if you would like to reach out to me. Um, as Jason said, we're on Facebook um, and we're pretty active there. We also have our website, alabamaforages.com.